today it's going to cover two topics. One is the um, what it took to develop the business plan and the piles. So it's just sort of what we went through to get here. And then after the break, we'll actually go through a lot more of the details on how the how the business plan works and what the numbers look like. Um, uh, well, I'll go too far into my own details. Uh, you all heard my introduction today. And you kind of know generally what we've done. Um, the actual police sort of cares. You know, the objective was to put together the program to supply electricity to the homes of a million patient people on a sustainable business model. The concept of hitting a million people um, is important, uh, and it was one of the early things Ray talked about. Because he's like, uh, I think it's Paul Pollock's number. And the reason you set that target is because this is way too much work to just hit a few people. You're going to spend too much money, too much time, too much effort. And if you're not going to do this to reach a million people, go do something else where you can have that kind of impact. Um, this, this is my legal disclaimer here. I've gotten into trouble many times with use of the IEEE and then the HTC and the CSI. If I say IEEE, CSI, or HTC, I mean all of them together all the time. Um, the, it's important to note this was true synergy. You know, the IEEE, CSI, HTC, Next Tech Power Systems, John Russell Engineering, um, Serona Fuels, Serona Cares, all of these, uh, Mission of Hope International, uh, the Haitian Health Foundation, these huge number of groups all contributed resources to this in this true synergy, um, taking skills that we all had uh, to work towards a common purpose. And it took, that's what it took to do this. This was not an accident. This was not some one person's brainchild and effort. This was contributions made by well over a dozen organizations to get this far. Um, raise the vision around CSI and the IEEE. Um, the original humanitarian technology challenge in CSI, what they wanted to do is have a, they wanted to use renewable energy to have a major impact on the eradication of poverty. Um, and this is all driven by the UN Millennium Development were wonderful goals, wonderful concepts. And I think a lot of people signed on to the concepts because it's a good thing. You know, try to eliminate poverty, try to improve uh, energy access to people. But it's hard to do. You know, it's not that many people with ideas on how you do this. But the concept of that Ray really launched off of and that created, that caused CSI to break out of HTC was something Ray talked about this morning. This is not about engineers sitting in their office or in their lab or in their sandbox making new things. This is about doing. This is about taking the technology that we have, integrating it, and putting it out in the field in a really cost-effective way. And in order to do that, they knew they, knew they needed to partner with local NGOs to create local businesses. This is not a charity model. Uh, for Serona Cares, we were formed to build sustainable communities. That was our mission. Um, we wanted to use renewable energy to improve people's lives. In my world, I watched the cycle of cash within a community. And functionally, all cash leaves every community in the same way. All cash ultimately leaves because you paid somebody else for oil or energy. And you just watch dollars go around in the community until they leave and go to Venezuela or Saudi Arabia. They come back through the purchase of our bonds. Um, we were focused, we, we had very little technology skills, so we were just looking for what's already out there that we can deploy. Michelle's Moringa project was one of the best examples of that early on. Uh, she did her own research, she found this product, educated the community, changed the lives of thousands of children. We didn't invent anything, we just deployed what was already out there. And the other thing Michelle talked about this morning was it wasn't about Serona creating new infrastructure. There's, in Haiti in particular, Haiti is like the NGO capital of the world. There's more NGOs per capita in Haiti than in any other country <coughs> in the world. We don't need another one. Um, so what we were focused on was how do we partner with the people already on the ground and take advantage of their resources and bring something new to the table. Between the two of us, there was this common vision and common pur pur purpose where we could supply affordable electricity to the bottom of the pyramid in an economically viable way without ongoing reliance on charity. That was huge. That last piece is the critical junction. 
anybody can buy solar panels and put them on top of the school and leave. The question is, how do we do this in a sustainable way where you kickstart it and let it go? Um, CSI and the IEEE brought a huge wealth of technical expertise, the commitment, and a commitment to the vision over and over again. Um, the IEEE, you know, the, the board of directors, the executive directors, the presidents of the different groups, Ray and Aldi, all these people were like, we are committed to this. And in particular, all of our short-term fundraising came through the different divisions of the IEEE, the different societies, uh, with the NPSS being a huge support. Uh, for Serona, what we were bringing to the table were in-country expertise, that same commitment to the vision, and the long-term fundraising assistance. Our commitment was if you know if you can get us started, you know, we'll we're prepared to carry the water the rest of the way. But what did it take? <laughs> it took a lot uh, for Serona Care students. This was not an accident. Um, we used our in-country knowledge, a lot of talking to people, to develop the business model. You know, Michelle talked a lot about how we partnered with the NGOs, how we met with people in the villages. We talked to them. My favorite discussion was actually with a couple in Jeremy, and uh, we're talking about how do we do the sustainable business model. And the woman uh, that we're talking with, her name is Betty, wonderful woman. She goes, you can't do this in Haiti. People don't have any money. I'm like, what do you mean they don't have any money? I, I, I walk down the street, I can buy a Coke. I see other people walking around with a Coke. They all have cell phones, they're paying something. And she's like, no, they don't have any money. I'm like, well, what about the cock rates? Every village has a cock rate for cock rates. And he's like, oh yeah, every time. Somebody's making a new cock rate. Like, Why? Well, they make money. So you just told me they don't have any money. How are they making money with a cock rate? And it's like, well, they charge admission and stuff like that. So they have money. If they have money to pay for admission to the sheet of cockfight and to gamble, they have money. So we talked about how the different how a number of different businesses in Haiti work. And the cockfight rings were actually a, a centerpiece, ironically enough. Um, we did a lot of market research. We you know, we talked earlier about you know interviewing over eight hundred people, you know, and this was not us, this was Haitian people from the community. We Pick we, not even us, we pick people who pick people to go to the community to talk to the people because nobody trusts anybody unless they're in a your neighbor. I show up, nobody's going to give me a straight answer. Um, and we were a huge bridge between the CSI, the IEEE, and the people. This was this is Serona's role, we're a bridge. You've got the technology, the desire to do good, you've got the people, the need, um, and we were, we were the bridge between those two things. We made this our primary mission, which is an important thing because Michelle was talking earlier, and most NGOs say they already have a primary mission. They don't have, they don't want to take on a new primary mission, especially one this big. Uh, this is actually a huge undertaking. Uh, and you need somebody who, the, their only mission in life is this project. Uh, so we were prepared to identify everybody, to train the people. Um, we are going to hire all the service providers we needed. We are prepared to make all the, the efforts to find the long-term support for the, for the project. Um, and you know, most importantly, figuring out how do we fund this after the IEEE is done. Because this was very clear from the beginning, just a finite commitment. Um, we've talked a lot about this, and we'll talk in great detail this afternoon about it. But uh, you've seen all this stuff. It centers on this wonderful kit. Um, it's a, you know, not, there's an 18 amp hour battery, but only nine usable amp hours. It's got a 50% cutoff switch to preserve the life of the battery. The DC outlets, the 2B LEDs, you know, flashlight. It's a very basic service of providing light and basic electricity. Uh, you get about 31 hours off of one light, all three lights for nine hours. You charge, you got a about nine cell phone charges out of it, run a battery, run your laptop, charge your laptop, one and a half days, run a small radio. So there's there's a reasonable amount of power sitting in there for people to use. What's crazy is that for fifty Haitian dollars a month, the customers rent the, the battery kits and they can recharge off because they need them once a day, and the charging rate is only three three hours. So for a very small amount of money. 
um, they have this basic electricity <coughs> service, and it's not an inconvenience. This is not putting out your solar lantern for all day while you wait for it to get a 50% charge and hope it doesn't get stolen while it's charging. These things are put in a secure location, and in three hours you can come up. And that was a big deal from the original design. Um, the central charging stations, you know, there's a top view of it, six solar panels looking down on it. Um, you've got the station operators. These are our guys in Ansabo. This is our most, this is actually our scariest um, deployment that we did. This is a fairly steep hill. This hill was so steep, you can see this, one of the stabilizers is fully extended and even that wasn't quite enough. It blocks under everything. Um, the station operators, though, their role is critical. Their job is to build the market. We don't do that. Uh, these are their, this is their business. These two guys have to go make sure they have customers, they have to collect money from their customers, they have to make sure their station is properly operated, and they need to tell us when it breaks. Uh, this is their business, this is not my business. My business is picking up the 300 bucks a month from those guys. Um, so what we do is we, we're, we provide all the equipment, so you've got the first six units that we procured, we maintain the stations, and we monitor and support the operator's business. So we do monitoring and support, but in terms of the actual work, it's all Haitian. And even our maintenance providers are all Haitian, um, our assembly workers will all be Haitian. The, um, uh, the old, kit, old stations were doing 40, the new ones will do 80, uh, but it's important to know just how important these stations are to the lives of the people. You know, this is a typical home in Haiti. It's nothing. Uh, this guy here, we put light. This is the first time they had electricity in their in their home. I've never seen a man dance more than that guy danced. So he turned on his light. He was dancing on his whole property, screaming, Daco, Daco, which is like, thank you. This is great. It was awesome. The woman cried. Um, and here, I saw one of the deployments, we dropped this unit here. You can't put these in town without a massive crowd gap. It's, it becomes this huge centerpiece. Michelle mentioned earlier, the operators are treated like the president of their neighborhood. It's that important. The system is designed to be sustainable. Again, this is not charity. So we actually have a flow of funds that goes in both directions. You know, we have sort of hate borrowing money from lenders. We spend the money on the equipment put the generating units in the ground, and the operators provide the service to the customers. The customers pay money to the operators. The operators pay money to us. We pay money to the labels. The operators earn a living. They improve their lives. The investors, debt providers get repaid. Everybody's happy in a sustainable model. Um, operators are earning about $200 a month per unit. Our field techs are well paid at $25 a day. and. Uh, Everybody makes money. It's sustainable. Um, you've already heard the story of Honoré. You know, this, <clears throat> the whole situation here is designed to create local jobs and promote local entrepreneurs. Local, local, local. You can hear that over and over from me. Because it's not about us. It's about the people on the ground. You know, the generating units are going to be assembled in Haiti. We will have Haitian assembly jobs. You know, we have field technicians that are trained by us to maintain the units. That's more jobs. Every operator has a job. Even the in-home battery customers, the guys walking around with this little case, they become little entrepreneurs. They run down to the market. They take their mark, their little case down to the market, charge people cell phones for like what 50 goo to pop. They won't tell us. They won't tell us. <laughs> One guy runs a wake service. So, you know, when somebody dies and they have the wake, he charges a couple of uh, two or three dollars, I think, to have his little lights at the wake. I mean, they are very creative because they're like, you know, one of 40 or 80 people in town with electric lights. Everybody is creative at the local level when you're giving them the tools and the opportunity. And that's what we're all about. Ray talked a lot about designing the technology. So I won't go too far into that, but the IEEE, really, this is what they did. You know, a lot of interaction, trying to figure out what this thing should look like. Um, we got some things right, we got some things wrong. But at the end of the day, these guys did an amazing job of <coughs> building these prototype, prototype stations and funding it. Um, that concept can't be overlooked. This It's not magic. It didn't happen by accident. It happened because the IEEE put a whole bunch of money into this. 
to make it happen. Uh, I did not have a big enough checkbook to write for this. Um, so without that kind of vision and financial support, just stuff doesn't happen. But without the guys on the ground, prepared to do it, it doesn't happen. Everything's designed to be easy. It has to be easy. You're working in a developing country. This is a complete set of deployment tools required to deploy those original units. Couple pressing wrenches, a screwdriver, a nut driver, and an Allen wrench. I mean, you know, this, this is the sum, this plus one reset button. This is the sum total of the operating switches. There are five breakers. You have to flip them on, and that's then the unit is ready to go. Uh, the, the original design had the racking system was just we pulled them out. It took 30, 40 minutes at most to go from show up to full operation. Uh, the, the lighting quick equipment uh, is very, very efficient. These kits are out there, very low wattage. It has to be. You're only got 100 watts, to, about 114 watts to work with. But we're not selling kilowatt hours. We're providing a lighting service. There's a big difference. In America, everybody talks about what's the per kilowatt hour cost of electricity. Nobody really cares. The real question is, how much did it cost me to light my home for a day, or a night, or a month? How much did it, did it cost me to have my cell phone charged for a month? I don't care if the kilowatt hour can cost me five bucks, but if I'm running a three watt LED and it costs me 50 cents a day to have my home lit, it's the same as having a lousy incandescent bulb and paying 10 cents a kilowatt. Uh, designing the business. <laughs> This is an issue that every, I think um, the different NGOs have brought up here. What we did in Haiti is not necessarily going to work everywhere. But what we did in Haiti was design something that was consistent with the local market. We talked to the people. We were like, what are you doing now? This would be a cell phone charging station. You know, there, there is a little battery hooked up to an inverter, hooked into a multi-strip cord, and they're charging their cell phones. This is what they do. This is somebody's in-home electricity system. It's a simple, I think it's like an 80-watt panel that direct feeds into a battery, which goes into a basic radio shack inverter and powers some uh, compact fluorescence. But the issue here was what we built had to look enough like what people were already doing that the market would accept it. We weren't, you know, we looked at things like solar ovens and, and other things where we were just like, the market doesn't do that. They're not going to use it but they will use something that looks like this. We did the market surveys. Michelle talked about that a lot. These were really important. This is one of the very first things Ray really commanded that we did. He's like, I'm not going to do anything until you guys get a market survey that shows me there's an economically viable opportunity to make money. So we sent, eight, so we sent a people out in the field to do these market surveys. Um, which have the results here. And you know, the biggest thing was sort of the two questions. What are you willing to pay for electricity? And that some people like nothing, you know, I'll pay something for it. And other people are like, I'll pay anything for it, um, which is not a particularly useful question when you actually go to collect the bill. But when we asked them how much are you spending already, that became much more useful. You know, understanding how much are they paying right now to charge their cell phones? How much are they paying right now on candles and kerosene? And on media, on average, it came out at about ten fifty a month. That that was a great number. You know, at ten fifty a month, we started looking at the numbers and saying, you know what? For ten bucks a month, we can make a model that will work. So, with the concept that there's enough of a market out there, people are interested in the product, even though they have no money. So what we're told, they are still spending 10 bucks a month on substitutes. Clearly, there's an opportunity. And then we had to get on to actually doing the phase one. one uh, ship the units from Long Island to Haiti. Um, they were actually, these, the first six are actually towed to this place um, by vehicle. This is up to my, our friend Patrick, who came out of nowhere delivering these things in like the biggest Jeep you'll ever see. The tires were like this tall. Um, Herculean effort section were undertaken by the, by the guy who ran this um, opening bridge. They opened a bridge that hadn't been open for five years to get these things delivered. Um, it's no small feat. We brought everybody together uh, at one location in Grand Bois to go through training. 
so we have Ray, me, um, and one other person providing a training overview for to the operators. These are all the operators. All operators were required to attend a training session. We had one group from Lazeal didn't show up. The uh, contracted operator sent his buddies down for his training. We're like, all right, you don't get a unit. And the guys who were there, they were like, what do you mean? Like, you can't send us home. We'll be disgraced. We'll have no pride. This is terrible. He said, well, we told you the rule. You didn't follow the rule. You don't get a unit. And now there's a unit with a wonderful label that says <coughs> Lazeal on it sitting in St. Helen. And a little marker to these guys. This is what happens when you don't follow the rules. Um, transporting the units to their locations. This is a nightmare, to say the least. Um, we designed these things to be told. And we actually had a pretty good trailer designed for it. The concept was we need to be able to have an easy way to get these to the locations. Unfortunately, it's really hard to build a trailer that will cross four feet of water when you're crossing rivers. Uh, roads that aren't really roads, but dried out creek banks. Um, trucks, you know, for, to get these things through this kind of train, we had to use a different truck. This is a flatbed truck. There's no lift gate in, in, in Haiti. It's not like you're, you're going to drive in with a forklift or a lift gate and gently load this thing onto the back of a truck. You've got some lousy flatbed. If you got to figure out how to get 3,200 pounds of equipment up, you know, or, up, up, on top of the flatbed that's just far off the ground. Um, me and the Haitians actually had a big argument over this. They're like, we'll build a ramp. I'm like, you're not going to build a ramp to put, you know, $30,000 worth of equipment that weighs 3,200 pounds on a bunch of plywood and push it up into a truck. Don't be silly. And uh, Michelle calmed me down. She's like, I'll let them try, let them try. And sure enough, they built themselves a ramp, and I jumped up and down on it. I had several people jump up and down on it. I'm like, this might work. And then eight Haitian people, sure enough, dragged this thing across the street, pushed it up in place. I'm like, Haitian ingenuity. Yeah, the truth of the matter is, the local people solve local problems all the time. You have to let them. There has to be guidance and oversight, but at the end of the day, let them solve let them solve the problem within certain problems. I tell, I, I remind, I remind <coughs> of here. Since I was looking for a solution to come from someplace else, I said Africans survived for thousands of years. They, so they, they know how to survive. <laughs> they can do it. Yeah. And it's not going to be our way. You know, we're the Ameri I'm the American white guy, right? And I've got my way of doing things, and it's not the Haitian way. Um, and quite frankly, when you're in Haiti, my way is a lot of times the wrong way. And to, for my own pride, to actually have to be able to step down from that and not be prideful and allow, allow my way to be the wrong way was a big step. So the phase one units uh, went to six different locations at Marmelade, Jeremy, uh, Osebo, St. Etienne, St. Alain. Um, the, uh, so these are all the different locations. Somebody had asked me, like, where did they all go? They went to a pretty good array a great array of socioeconomic backgrounds as well. Uh, this, is, this is our pinnacle picture up here, the, the ring of light. That's 20 of the home kits set up at Honorate's um, orphanage. It was just a big party that night. I mean, you talk about an orphanage that did not have electric light in their home ever. And uh, had this ring of light set up. The kids were singing and dancing. We just had a good, amazing, amazing experience. But every, and every one of these stories is unique. You know, you've got Jeremy and Honoré, which Michelle talked about. You have Ansevo down here, two young guys, um, just very entrepreneurial. They want to earn a living. They're like, I just, I, I, I can do this if somebody would give me a chance, give me a resource, give me the ability to, to do something. Um, and we did. We're like, all right, let's see what happens. Um, the gentleman down here in Dijon Plan, you know, it's, 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 you know, wonderful pillar of his community, very solid guy um, that we, lo we love dearly. But because of his position in society, actually, as sort of, you know, the middle to upper level within his community, he actually had problems collecting from his customers. They're like, why do I have to give you my 50 Haitian dollars? You have money. And we're like, because he's got to give that money to us. <laughs> uh, St. Helene was run by a, a, a group of um, uh, pastors. And they just didn't have the heart to collect the money. 
And you're like, dude, if you don't have the cart to collect the money, I don't have the heart to leave you with the unit. Um, Marmalot, <coughs> this is one of the funniest deployment stories. This unit, you know, you know, what these original units cost us almost 30 grand a pop to build and deploy. Um, when it got sent up to Marmalot, the deployment team looked at where they were planning to put it and said, you can't do it, you can't put it here. And they left. <coughs> and I was livid, I was totally freaked out because my, one of my units that I had to get deployed was, was sitting in town at the pits of bed. And, um, and I promptly got into a vehicle and over the course of about just under, I guess 12 hours, 14 hours, I, I, was, I was like here. <laughs> I had to get here. Um, by the time I got there, they had taken this 3,200 pound piece of equipment up a road that was just nothing but rocks, big rocks, taken it down a drop of about that far to get from the road down to a flat area, carted over up another probably foot high ledge over which it went down this to get into this fortress that they had built. And when this thing showed up, that wall was still up. So the deployment team looked at you can't do that. And they're like, no, no, we'll build a ramp. Oh, and we'll tear down that wall, don't worry. And the deployment team was like, dude, we're not going to sit here for a week while you figure out how to get this thing into your little fortress. By the time I got there, that unit was, was installed and that wall had been rebuilt. So in the span of 12 hours, they tore down a wall, built a complete ramping system, moved 3,200 pounds worth of equipment into this location, deployed it, rebuilt the wall. And I'm like, I showed up there and the operator knew I, I was upset that things hadn't gone right. And um, while people love it when Michelle shows up, they hate it when I show up. <laughs> this black guy turned white. I showed up unannounced. And he knows things aren't, hadn't gone well. And he was just convinced I'm pulling that unit. And I look at it and I'm just like, wow. Good job, guys. <laughs> I don't feel it. it was just absolutely amazing. Um, but all of these have their own story. Every story is unique. Uh, every story has its own challenges. And none of this happens by accident. It's a, a huge dedication, financial dedication resource and volunteer dedication, the willingness um, to, to sit on this thing and push enough muscles through it to get it done. The, um, we got everything deployed, uh, went through customer training sessions, this is actually Honoré, it was one of the customer training sessions Honoré did. He sat down, every one of his operators sat down with every one of their customers and walked them through. Everybody signs a contract. Um, everybody's taught how to use this stuff. There's, there are sign-up sheets. The, customer, the operator has a record of who got which unit. What's the literacy rate right there? Uh, it's very low, very, very low. But but most people can sign their name. Most people can identify a number. You know, there's a little number on the kit. You know, and, and so the literacy rate is incredibly low, which is partly why we modified the labeling. Mm -hmm. so we changed the labels to uh, to mitigate that issue. Uh, and it's a lot of verbal people. Even with the training with the operators um, was verbal and, and as well as reading, training with the field technicians, go through the book with them verbally, we show them everything. It's very, very interactive. This is not, here's the book and you leave. Um, the phase one, one results were incredibly important. We were charged with a, with a huge mission and, and we we're incredibly grateful to the IEEE, Ray, and the CSI to have to have given us this opportunity. Every bit as grateful as the guys in Dizzy at the bottom were. They're like, just give me a shot, we'll prove this. Um, you know, Ray and the CSI, Isaac Lee said, well, let's give this a shot. And we were under enormous amount of pressure to prove it. We knew it would work, and we were not going to be the failure in the um, And we were, we were very successful. Uh, we de de demonstrated the viability of the project and the usability of the technology. The, uh, demonstrated the ability of the local entrepreneurs to operate their franchises. Um, and we demonstrated that the local market wanted this product, which all those things were huge, because half of these, people are like, you can't do this over and over again. This won't work. You can't do this. And we're like, well, we disagree. We're going to try. 
So for in the market, those light bulbs were huge. Michelle talked about this earlier. The market loved the product. It's that simple. The operators. The operators loved the asset. It was easy to use. Uh, it was a revenue generator. It was, it was fantastic. The whole thing worked um, very much as planned uh, without overlooking the amount of muscle that went into actually getting it done. Um, so now we've gotten through phase one, and phase two is where we're at. We have the additional line units that are in uh, customs at Port of Prince. They'll come out um, hopefully tomorrow. We'll do final assembly. Um, there's three, uh, 360 home kits already there. USAID provided the funding for the additional home kits to take it up to 83 kits per unit. Um, and Michelle mentioned as well that really the, the original donation contributions from the IGO believe the nine units we functionally lever leveraged into what will function hopefully be 10 more. Um, as well as sort of getting that initial infrastructure in the ground for assembling these units in the, um, <coughs> By the end of the year, we expect that 12,000 people will have electricity as a We'll have 25 operators operating their businesses, two or three field technicians with full-time jobs actually working in Haiti, plus all the people with their little home kit earning revenue off of uh, cell phone charging or sewing at night, as well as increased study time. It's been, it'll be massive. Um, the other piece of wolf that we're finishing right now is commercializing the complete supply chain. Um, and we'll talk about that, I think, tomorrow is to talk about the manufacturing process and the logistics supply chain. So that's what that's what it took just to get this far. Uh, it can't be understated what the dedication from the IEEE to make sure their engineers did their job and their funding commitments were met. <coughs> that Serona lived up to its part of it. We held our people accountable as well. We drove a lot of people hard to get this done and continue to um, form the Haitian corporation. So now we're transitioning this out. This is the end of the NGO phase. Fantastic, we've done the NGO part now, commercial. Um, parents of the Haitian country assembly facility. Michelle talked about the UNEP program. We're actually taking the same technology and putting it at the you know, end of grid application. So basically the same product, <coughs> no solar panels. We're developing a program I'll talk this afternoon in a little bit more detail to monetize the revenue from units to buy more units. So at this stage, we're actually putting together um, the, the bond issuance that will allow us to continue to expand without additional charity. Um, but on top of that, we still have an enormous amount of interest from USAID, from IADB, from all kinds of funding organizations that are looking at these results saying, what can you you know, can we do this again? Did you see bond this show? Yeah. Explain that, please. The, um, <clears throat> by the end of this year, we'll have 25 units in the ground. 25 units generating uh, $300 a month in income for the survey. About $100 a month of that goes towards uh, maintenance costs, pay the field technicians and other you know, equipment maintenance. The remaining $200 a month covers science costs and corporate operations. So what will happen with that extra $200 a month, $200 a month over 10 years, what I can do is I can issue what we're calling energy poverty loans. Um, I actually gave my first sermon on this a few weeks ago, um, where <clears throat> what we're doing is that asset will generate a certain dollar amount over 10 years. I basically can package that revenue stream sell you a bond. So you, you buy a bond for $1,000 or $10,000, so I take your $10,000, but every month I've given you back 100 bucks for the next 10 years. Would that be for the local efficient market or would it be for the American market? For whoever gave you the $10,000. It's a bond issuance. So basically, I'm raising money. It's just, this is not charity. This is not a charity model. Don't think of it as a charity. Don't think of this as being overly socialistic. We're here. You can't do this sustainably thinking you're going to live life in a commune or in a social, you know, we don't ever make any money or ever pay the bank back the bank the money that it, that it went. 
it has to repay debt. So bond issuance is just a way to monetize the revenue stream that you get over 10 years, get all that money today, go buy another unit, <coughs> put another unit in the ground, and then take the revenue stream that you'll generate off that new unit over the next 10 years, sell a bond again, <laughs> and repeat the process. It's a very elegant solution where one, in this case, 25 generating units, I'm going to turn into 25 units at a time over and over again for as long as I can sell these energy poverty bonds. Well, you hear about government bonds, but the government issues bonds, right? So if the government gives you a bond for, say, a million dollars, the government gets your million dollars, but you're, as long as you're not holding Greece bonds, you'll get that million dollars plus interest back over the next, you know, two years, five years, ten years. So a bond is just when it's just a little money. So you, you know, the bond issuance is the same thing. You know, you give us ten thousand dollars, you'll get that ten thousand dollars back over the next ten years plus interest. Okay, but where are you refunding your capital investment if your if your three hundred dollars a month is going towards maintenance and the bond? A hundred, a hundred, um, a hundred dollars a month is the maintenance cost. So that's your two hundred dollars a month in net cash, free cash. Plus, you got to pay over corporate overhead. So the bond, the um, the extra cash in there goes to repay, goes to is monetized on the bond issue. So if I say say I sell the bond at a hundred dollars a ten thousand dollar bond and I pay it back at a hundred dollars a month for the right. next ten years, that still leaves me with a hundred dollars left over for corporate operations. But is that enough to buy it? So how did you, how did, yeah. How did you pay for the how many bonds do you need for a silver trailer? Uh, you need about ten yeah. the co equipment cost is ten thousand dollars, fully loaded cost is fifty. What's your question? Where are you paying your capital? Yeah. You've been kickstarted. The, the original 25 units were funded with grants. Okay. So you've been kickstarted. That's the whole point. I've kickstarted you. So now I've got these 25 units, the first ones. Now I'm going to monetize their revenues. I'll buy 25 more. Those 25 more I will own. There's no debt stream because the debt's already associated with the first 25. You do it again on the next 25. You repeat the process. And for someone like, I'm not familiar with the financial services, how much of an over, administrative overhead is involved in managing a, a, a bond issue? Uh, the, bond, the bond issuance is easy. It's easy? Yeah, okay. that's good. That, and we have three different brokers that are really interested in that. Oh, oh right. That's, that's, that's what I was saying. And thinking. then you're just talking about making sure you've got an accounting system that cuts the checks off. It's, it's not that hard. But I'll give a little bit more detail on that this afternoon. So that is, that's just sort of the, what it took to get here. And we're, so a personal question. Two of you have invested a lot. Yeah, we've invested and, about a quarter million dollars. Yes. Right. Um, the $100 a month overhead is sustaining you in Haiti or no? You've got $100 <laughs> going into maintenance. You've got $100 a month going into the investment. You've got a leftover $100 a month for $2,500. With 25 units, it's $2,500 a month. Yeah, that's $100 per year. Going to cover corporate overhead. So I've got, we got and within corporate overhead are, are you two. Yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay, and other things. So expanding it Haiti wide is growing Haitian personnel or yes. making you 12 months a year in Haiti or is that not even in the game plan? Um, not necessarily the right question on this. The, <clears throat> the primary focus is asset deployment, number one. Correct. Dollars have to go into assets. That's like, because right. that's what kicks off more cash. Right. Um, the second thing is debt needs to be repaid. Right. Um, your op and your operators, your your personnel need to be repaid, be going to be paid. So those are all those are sort of your, your priority items. Right. And then whatever's left over is left over for the for the for, for the company owners. Right. So, you know. so do you have a, a model? Are, are, you, are your models all predicated on having grants to get it kickstarted? Or the is kick, the, you can do it. You can do it without the grant kickstart. Yeah. Um, but then what you're doing is, <clears throat> with the grant kickstart, it kind of creates this neat concept. 
because here in particular, okay, I've got 25 units that I own outright, generating, you know. Okay, and there's some dry erase markers over there, and there's a big, beautiful whiteboard. And I'm trying to get a handle on this. You know, for our application in Cameroon, let's say we want to do this in Cameroon, so can you, is this the right time to do this? Sure. Every moment? So yeah, that's pretty much this is just what it took to get here. Yeah. I'll give you some really hard, some more hardcore numbers this after with mm -hmm. more fighting, more numbers. But the bond issuance is something I'm really excited about. Yeah. You know, we kind of came came up with this, started looking at it, talked to a couple brokers, and talked to a couple of Christian communities about it. I gave a sermon on this uh, three weeks ago, and uh, several of, of my of the members of the church came up to me and they were like, "This is awesome." So you mean I can invest my dollars? I'm not right. just giving money away. Yeah. I'm investing money in this thing that does good and earning a, some kind of a return. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Paul, let me just to emphasize this question. I'm not sure if you want to explain all of that now or at a later time. But that the question you asked is important for me because I just I just gave up a paycheck and I don't and I don't have another paycheck coming in. All right. So <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question that he's asking is I, I want to I, I want to get the answer to that question. At one unit a year, or at one unit a month, or at one unit in the field, it will never ever pay for me, and I will continue to give up the paycheck. Right. At a thousand units in the ground, yes, it easily supports me. But it, um, but that's not, you know, that, so you're just sort of, you know, 25, 100, where's that number? Somewhere between 25 and 1,000, there's enough money in there. Um, but they, they, this is not, Haiti is only one spot. And this is the vision and Ray's, Ray's mandate was, we're not doing this for Haiti. Haiti's all fine and dandy and needs it and we're happy to do this here. But Paul, don't give me a model that just does Haiti. That's silly. I want to come. I'm old, man. I want to see the world change before I get too long and too old. I can't do this anymore. You mean you have Cameroon in that too old age? He's <laughs> <And laughs> so. all these other 50 countries in Africa. Good. Let's check him, brother. If he was on the training workshop. That's right. But we've also, you know, in terms of earning a living, um, the USAID grant, you know, that kind of stuff is actually covering a lot of our salary right now. There's another grant that's coming on. We'll talk about this afternoon of the assembly facility. That pays us to be in Haiti. And hopefully at some point over the next year, there's enough units in the ground that it covers not just my managers in country, but also pays me enough, pays us enough money. But and I'm fairly confident in that. So basically, on the bond issuance, let's talk about a more, how, how, most of y'all are from the energy industry, right? I'm not wrong. I know you are. You're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Usually what happens is, you know, P, uh, what's the name of your local utility? ESCOM. ESCOM. ESCOM? Yeah. So you have ESCOM. E-S-C-O-M. K-O-M. K-O-M. Okay. So they'll sell, just, just make it all debt, so just to make this easy. They sell bonds. They'll issue company bonds, you know, and they raise, let's say, $10 million. Bondholders. They take this money, right, and they buy a big old power plant. Yeah. All right. Classic. <laughs> there, there's your there's your kilowatt hours going out, and here's your rate payers out here. Rate payers send money back. You know, pays your kilowatt hour. ESCOM collects the money, you know, and then ESCOM repays its bondholders. That's sort of a normal project finance deal. I used to work for Calpine, which is an independent power producer in America. We did this all day long. What do we do? Well, we go borrow $10 million from the bank, we take $10 million, we build a big power plant, we sell our electricity, we take some of that electricity revenue, and we give it to the bank to repay our $10 million. And hopefully you don't file for bankruptcy. Right. Well, then, <laughs> and then the electricity market tanks, and we all go out of business, and then yeah. So that this is a traditional model. Now you can repeat this actual same model with with our program. I have to try eraser. So get rid of this. And let's just change this to one thousand dollars to the bondholder. Okay. The. Uh, 
Here is Sirona 80. Get rid of our nasty coal plant over here. And we'll put it in our little sun blazer trailer. Okay. Get rid of the wires. And we've got our little is that a little battery kit with its little light and stuff. Okay, so here on this model, Serona Haiti could you've got you can issue bonds, you know, for ten thousand dollars. You know, you get the ten thousand dollars in, you spend your dollars on on this, you know, and you rent out the battery kits from the little rate payers. They pay their pennies back to the operator, and the operator pay the pennies back to Serona Haiti and Serona Haiti repays the model. It's the exact same utility. Let's talk about what happens when you kickstart. Now, <coughs> that trick, how much you move that chair out of the way from the business? Oh, this one? Yeah, yeah. Get closer to the when, you're, when you're SCOM, you can do this, right? Everybody knows you. You're the Very biggest good good utility in town. Right. You're regulated. You're going to get your money back. If you're, if you're a bondholder in SCOM, your bond is going to be repaid, and they don't have a problem raising money. If you're Serona Haiti, you say, Hey, lend me ten thousand dollars. I promise you, I will go buy a, my little sun blazer, and I'll put it in the ground, and I'll collect this money and give it back to you. <laughs> You're like, I like the concept, but dude, seriously? <laughs> I mean, come on, no, come on, it's only ten grand. It's all right. It's a, it's a tough sell. So change this. So now, Serona Haiti is sitting here, and we've been given the first twenty-five units. So we already have, you know, our little trailers out there, with our battery kits. We're getting our pennies back from our repairs. We're getting our three hundred dollars here. Let's just call it two hundred dollars because I got to pay my little maintenance here. On this cycle, because I already own this. These dollars end here. I can stop and put it in my pocket. Pay the corporate, pay the corporate overhead, right? There's no more, you know, what I'll do is I'll save it up. I'll save up the two hundred dollars and eventually I'll have enough money to buy another solar sun blaze and I'll put it in the ground. But what I could also do is take that take that two hundred dollars or a hundred dollars, say I take a hundred dollars of it and I'll issue bonds. So I issue ten thousand dollars in bonds monetized against this revenue stream. Does that make sense? But keep in mind, I already own this one. So this $10,000 goes right. in. Where is your, there's no collateral, are you saying that they're, the bonds are collateralized by the 25 units they already have? Or exactly. Are they this? They're okay. actually collateralized by the revenue stream and the existing assets. All right. that's, so then I've got another 25 that's your, units. That's where you're reducing your leap of faith there. You've eliminated, uh, uh, yeah, not eliminated, but it's great. 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 <laughs> At this stage, I've got six months or twelve months. Right now, I've got what, twelve months of twelve months of payment records from my current operators. Right. I can go to the bank, or and I wouldn't. Wells Fargo is probably not going to lend me money against this, right. but the World Bank will. Um, so now you've got this track record of payments from your customers. You're like, this works. So I can monetize and issue bonds against it. Take the ten thousand dollars from the bond issuance, buy another batch. Now the revenue stream off of this batch is not monetized yet, right? These are brand new ones. I own them. The ten thousand dollars are being repaid off of these guys, so I can repeat the process. Well, what I'm trying to get at is, is you say issue the bonds, and that sounds very easy, but in a practical sense, how does that happen, or how do you? I mean, your units are in Haiti. You're, you say you're going to collateralize that, but there's no way to collect. I mean, if you go to the bank, I mean, which bank or how are you, in a practical sense? Well, this is what the Acumen Fund is, this impact investment. You yeah. have alternatives to the banking system. Yeah, well, as far as I can that role right. precisely. Right. And there are more and more of them. Yeah. You, could, you, could, you could go for a million or ten million with the number of <coughs> Acumen type ventures there are. Yeah, all we have to do, like with 25 units in the ground, it's a quarter million dollars at a time. It's not that, it's, it's a good chunk of money, but it's not a Herculean chunk of money. 
And it's not a huge leap of faith because the app, you're just monetizing assets that are in the ground. You're not waiting for more to be built. In terms of the logistics, like what do you do? Uh, you write a bond, you write an offering memorandum, to the, the sell to the brokers, the brokers will pedal that to their groups, they'll sell it, you'll get the cash, less your broker's fees, then you're going to need to set up a, an accounting infrastructure to cut the checks and, and just sort of keep track of everything, but that's, you know, that's just a process. I don't know what you think about this, but I've always thought that if, if our American churches would not pack their shares as much as they do, we might not even have to go to the bank to get that ten thousand dollars, but maybe that's a pipe dream for me. Well, because I know that in my church, we spend a lot of time arguing about how well padded the, the pews are, and yeah. well, maybe another discussion for another time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But we were talking about this a little bit at lunch. Um, <laughs> the church. Don't go there, Dan. <laughs> The church, as an institution, gets bogged down with its own decision-making processes. And if you look at like the Isaac Lee, at the you know you have your own decision-making process. And you say, no, we're going to do something different. That's a big step for a big organization. It's huge. Church, you know, suffers from the same problem. And the church may or may not be able to make that same leap that the Isaac Lee did. But the individual church members are not the church, yeah. and they are prepared to do this. Wonderful. So. What's the list of acumen type bondholders that are on your radar screen for this kind of capitalization? Michelle's got that list. Um, World Bank, IDB, um, then we've got the Intermediate Re Development Fund. You know, the, there's a lot of money it's sitting waiting to be invested in Haiti. We hit that. Clinton Bush, um, Haiti Fund is another one. And <coughs> acumen doesn't work where we work. But it's the right type of investment, I just want to know where we are. At MEDA. MEDA? M-E-D-A. To your list, they were together. They've been at it for 40 years. I was just curious, Sirona Haiti is your for-profit entity, right? Is that a, is that a corporate entity registered in Haiti, or the U.S., or both? Haiti. Okay. okay, so what are the, um, for the corporate entity, what are the accountability and accounting uh, hurdles that you might have? I mean, was this a model already uh, part is, of the corporate culture? This uh, is brand culture? new. This and, is two months old. Uh, so you haven't really so, figured out how you're going to do this with the corporate entity and the community? I mean, are there yeah, well, restrictions it, from... There are very few restrictions in Haiti. I'm actually not worried about the Haitian rules. I'm more worried about the U.S. SEC well, that's why rules. That's why I said. Because the U.S. SEC rules apply, even though I'm incorporated in Haiti, yeah. if I sell bonds in America, I'm still subject to SEC right. rules. SEC rules and the Jobs Act changed um, in April. This actually is what created this opportunity. The old rules were pretty much any time I uttered the words, would you like to buy a bond, I was uh, I was executing this um, public offering and subject to SEC rules. Oh, right. So that changed it. The job act the job act changed that. The current rules um, actually have allowed me to to market to accredited investors and a limited number of unaccredited investors. But that's not the one I really care about. The one I really care about is the crowdfunding rules. Crowdfunding rules that need to be in place by the end of the year. Crowdfunding rules actually allow you to do functionally public offerings of debt up to $10,000 at a time from an individual, no individual can put in more than $10,000 and you can't raise more than a million dollars in a 12 month period. But those rules are very, very uh, limited compared to the public offering rules. But we're still waiting for the SEC to issue all those rules, which is why I can't say, well, this is what, this is a check the box process. But um, that's actually, that's what's on our radar screen. Watching for those rules. So, Paul, well, based on the, the rate that you set right now, what's the percent interest that you pay out of it? Uh, it's like about uh, five and a half, six percent. Okay. So, maybe you can adjust your rate here. From a from a risk adjusted return, it's lousy. Yeah. But it is a return. It, it is. It's. Um, but yeah, you know, if we really a risk adjusted return, people are looking for thirty percent. So mm -hmm. it's like not gonna happen. 
So your initial pilot phase was done as charity, and those were donations to your charitable organization? Yes. Well, and a combination, because the IEEE put the units together, um, contributed those to sort of CARES. Um, I, the USAID actually bought nine of those units and contributed those to Sir Haiti. Um, so it's a little bit of both, but at the end of the day, the you know the, pro, the NGOs ultimately can't really own anything; they have to give everything away. So that's well. What, what my books say is everything went to Sir Cares because we are not allowed to give anything to a for profit that was being developed in parallel. Everybody knows exactly what the plan was. So there's no issue with that. Um, we should point out, though, that um, you already did this cycle. You leveraged the stuff that we most recently built Correct. before it even hit the ground yeah. to get an extra $250,000 to build an So he, he's already run that. So the money's coming for 10 more units that you should put in. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Already happened. So who did you go to to get what kind of incident? That was USAID. And this, the second group yeah. for, for this additional ten. The first six <coughs> were full on. Yeah, and then the and nine. Then the next was USAID. nine were basically the were funded by magically okay. bought by USAID. Right. To and to donated to Haiti. Right. And money coming back, which allows us to buy to fund another camp. If we're smart enough. I know it's crazy. It's it, the problem is this is one of those things where nobody's done it before. Yeah. This concept of sustainable enterprise, kickstarting for profit entities doesn't exist. Everybody talks about it. Wouldn't it be great if we had sustainable enterprises? Like, yes, it would. But nobody has done it. Yeah, the seed money. So this is sort of the first time. There's a there's a number of, of hurdles like you know dealing with like the IEEE stuff and making sure it gets documented the right way. So not trying to cause any risk, not trying to do anything illegal. It's making sure we do check the boxes properly. Um, but at the end of the day, the intent has always been this, and, and that's kind of where at the end of the day, we, you know, I don't know that the, the, some of the units will ultimately will title transfer or will it be an operating agreement. Those are those are Yes. And until it is supported by the local economy, it's not developed. You get development when whatever you're doing is supported by the local economy. Until um, that begins to until that happens, you're still on a on a on a on a sort of a well welfare kind of system. And the good thing here is that you are getting to the place where the local economy is already feeding into the into the thing. And you can actually now walk away and say, that's, that's done. Yeah, depending on how you define local you know, yeah. economy, because it is, it's about taking the pennies, literally, you know, literally pennies a day, you know, that the local community is funneling into this. Exactly. But you've got to take those pennies and you've got to aggregate them and get money from the people who have money. It's not Haiti or Cameroon. You've got to get the World Bank. You gotta be at you know OPEC. You gotta be at uh, IEDB. You gotta go to people with the cash. But the important thing is that you went to the World Bank and said, "Here is what I'm getting from Haiti." Yes. Yeah. And when we went to this the first time, when we were here trying to do this model with, with the World Bank, they're like, "Yeah, talk to us in a couple of years." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but but this one, people are actually like, "Really?" You know, CBHF, Clint Bush Haiti fine. When we were when we were more here, they're like, "No." You're not there yet. And uh, we, uh, CBHF was funny because on one hand, we weren't here. You know, they weren't like, oh, you guys are so far along, we can help you out with loans. But we also were too far along with them. We're like, well, you're too far along for us to give you a grant. Mm -hmm. We're like, seriously? <laughs> we're like, somehow, the organization whose mission is to bridge the gap between pure grant and pure profit is sitting here telling me, I'm in the gap and you won't fund us. So, but you know, with a lot of hard work from the IEEE, a lot of hard work building relationships with the USAID and the government, kind of gotten to this point. <clears throat> this gets better the bigger it gets. It's hard to do this for the first 25 with just hate. If 
you take the same concept and you and you aggregate it with Cameroon, with South Sudan, with a number of other African countries, the bigger this gets, the easier the bondage is. And then, and then, just to add to that, we don't have to discuss it here, but just think about it. Not only we we expand that geographically, but we we add other things that are different from energy. Maybe like I was mentioning to you, the farm school becomes another thing where this model can be this try. This concept, what's exciting about this, we're actually using the same model in our Tichoka project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so exactly. Like Which is the farm school that I'm talking so, about. So it, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's replicable. This whole thing this had to be scalable, had to be replicable, replicable had to be sustainable. And we kind of think we've gotten there and are excited to see kind of how it all plays out. I'm still trying to get the practical aspects of this in terms of a model that you, know, you can take to Nigeria, take to South Sudan, or take to Cameroon and, and apply it. So it's like, what is the seed money that's needed, or then what are the steps? You know, what, do, what do we need to do in order to qualify? But I think I think what what we're going to need to do is fertilize that soil, right. and then we send. These people who know about those farms, they know how to talk to the World Bank. I see. And they will talk to them for us. Isn't that the case? We fertilize the grassroots, right? Make it easier, make it easier for these people to talk to the World Bank. Uh, let me share something you like um, what we have in Nigeria from um, our partnership with the um, UNDP Bank of Industry in Nigeria. Um, they require us to get like 30% equity of the initial projects and mm -hmm. deployment costs. And they will assist us in talking with other development sessions exactly. to assist with like 70% equity. Or then the, 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 the entire budget cost will be covered with also 80% guarantee from the USAID. So I think that's a very practical model that will be feasible. Well, the, the process in terms of how you do this, it starts with, with, with the work Michelle was doing. Relationships, because all the stuff I just talked about, like with you know the work that went into Haiti, it, it wasn't an accident. It was a lot of on the ground time spent with people. What works? What's not going to work? How much muscle does it take to get one of these units in the ground? Um, but the process is very, it's, it's very, very replicable. But it starts with visits. You know, with you know, send out Michelle or somebody you know, to go, all right, what's happening in Cameroon? What does the village look like? How do people do commerce? There is commerce going on. There are people that are alive and growing food. They have cows or goats or something. There is commerce. Where there is people, there is commerce. Understand the commerce that's happening right now. Understand where it does, how does this fit? A lot of discussion with Robin Pottle, <coughs> where he's like, this is too expensive. Not everybody can afford $6.25 a month. And I'm like, right. And if you can't, I'm the wrong, this is not the right project for you. You need something else. Mm -hmm. This is not. And then have other people that are like, we can do more than this. We want more than this. You're like, great. But this is not the right project for you then either. It fits a niche. And it's a nice niche. It's a big niche. But it's not one size fits all. And it starts, though, with understanding the actual community you're going to. You can, um, you know, learn from some other countries that are even poorer than have been through worse straits than Haiti. Uh, you know, take Bangladesh. I mean, they, out of their own blood and out of their own culture and civil wars, created their own NGOs that are doing exactly this sort of bond-holding relationship. I mean, BRAC, and Grameen, and ASHA. They don't have to go outside the country for this capitalization. They've designed an in-country now. And they have created literally a, a cradle-to-grave set of services and goods for Bengalis uh, and have the entire capitalization scheme down for Bengalis. So I'd love uh, to see that model. Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's path-breaking. And it's imperfect. But they've done it in the absence of government. They've done it without international investment. 
they've done it in the wake of cyclones and droughts and floods and civil war. I mean, it's, it's very doable. And so even the very poorest Bengali had the capital aggregated Right. Aggregated. That's what it is. Everybody's got several, it. several million people <laughs> full. They aggregated and, and created a system that works for Bengalis. So, so far, is Sarona Haiti set up within Sarona Cares? No, this is separate. Thing. So, how do you, you know, use an asset as a collateral that doesn't belong to you? Well, the first, the first six don't belong to us, uh, and but. But even within that, somebody has to operate them. Somebody has to run them. Somebody has to deal with the revenue coming off of it. Yeah. And Serona, Serona Cares as a 501c3 right. can't. So, um, so it's, somebody's got to be contracted to run that stuff. So okay. the assets may stay with Serona Cares from a physical, from a legal standpoint or a physical standpoint, but the revenue streams will still be monetized, will be monetizable by Serona I think you do have the option to set up Serena Haiti for, 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 for profit, under a not profit, so that in a way you're using your parents, you know, pass it as a collateral. That, that's, that is not one, you know, okay. with the intricacies of foreign, of, of, of 501c3 owning things, and also the intricacies of any entity in America owning foreign companies. Mm -hmm. I don't have the cash to pay the legal bill for that one. 